Aloha. Aloha. What a blessing to be here at Honolulu and to uh, have an opportunity to uh, reach uh, out to our, our fellow Christians in training uh, soul winners for the Lord. You have been one of the most hospitable people that we have ever experienced in our travels. Four years ago, I pulled our family out of full-time local work uh, where I had been preaching full-time 23 years. And uh, we decided that uh, because of the circumstances the church was facing, that we had to go out into our nation and train churches how to reach lost people. And so we started this school four years ago. And in the four years we traveled, last year we hit 52 churches of Christ. In that, in that period of time, we, um, in that period of time, we have, um, we experienced a lot of receptions from brethren all over the country, none better than the reception we've received here in this church, uh, from the apples to the grapes, to the, the pap papaya, to the lays, to the, the big poster as we, we uh, disembarked the aircraft, came down the escalator, said Whitaker family, aloha, welcome to the uh, kind and gentle uh, knocks on the door to the, uh, just the, oh, the outpouring and overwhelming of prayers from this church. We're so grateful to be here. This is going to be an exciting eight days. Um, I hope and pray that you'll look back on this period of time and this, the history of this church, and you'll say it's one of the most significant, it's one of the most significant events that we've ever embarked upon. We're seeing in the churches enrolled in our school some remarkable things. I'm going to share those with you this week, Jedediah, you did an excellent job. Your dad and your mom would be so, they're so proud of you. They're thankful for the man you've become. I know his mom, I know his dad. We're going to be at Covington very uh, soon, working with the church there in a campaign. And so it's it's just a privilege. I know some of you are visiting this morning. Uh, you have the lay on like we do, and you've uh, you've come to the island to enjoy the, uh, the serenity and the hospitality of the people. So you're in for a treat this morning. Because we're going to focus on soul winning, on how to reach lost people. You know, Jesus said that we are to lift up our eyes and look on the fields, for they are white unto harvest. Brethren, I want you to look around you this morning. There are lost people everywhere. You do not have to do a search mission to find people who are lost. You live next to a door to them. You work with them. They're your neighbors. They're on your ball teams. They, they, you go to, you, you, you spend time with them at the markets. You, you walk up and down the streets with them. It's not like they're hard to find. This isn't like going deer hunting in Hawaii. This is a, this is, this is a, oh no, you're, you're going to, you're going to find a whole lot more lost folks than that. And so what I want to do as we introduce uh, this school to this church is to commend the church, first of all, for hosting this event, to commend your elders for seeing the wisdom of training the church and helping the congregation work together as a body of Christ to reach lost people. Because if you, if you place the responsibility of soul winning on Lima and just his family, brethren, you will not succeed. You see, the Church of Christ is an army of soul winners and if the army doesn't work together, if the army is not trained, if the army doesn't understand her mission in distinct terms, you will not succeed. And so this week, our job is to lay out the mission to show you how the army can work together. Every member will have a work to do. Every member will have a part to play. No one will be exempt from this. I hope and pray this will be an exciting time for this church. I want you to go ahead and open your Evangelism Simplified Guidebook. Go ahead and get your pen ready. Go to the back page. It says notes. This is an active seminar. This isn't a gospel meeting. Brethren, I did not come this morning to present a gospel meeting. I'm not opposed to gospel meetings. I think they do much good. This is a training seminar. This is interactive. This is going to require on your part for participation to take place, just as it should in any sermon. I want you to write this down in your notes section. The very last page, it says notes. Write down evangelism.housetohouse.com. Understand there's no www. It's not World Wide Web. This is a private website. It's designed for members of the Church of Christ. On that website, you're going to find videos. You're going to find downloads. You're going to find information to help equip you to become a better soul winner. That is our website. I want you to write that down. What's the school of evangelism? This is not a brick and mortar school. 
My family literally travels the nation. And uh, we, we go to churches and we bring the training, the material. We bring a, a plan, a A to Z model for evangelism right into the heart and soul of the church. And we spend time helping equip that church. Now, when you enroll in our school, you're going to get one year of training. So my, our time with you here uh, physically is just a beginning point. You're going to get literally 52 weeks of training given to your preacher, to your elders, and as they see fit to this congregation so that you can literally learn from A to Z how to be an effective soul winner to your neighbors and friends. And I know at the very beginning, you might be thinking, preacher, are you sure this is going to work in the Hawaiian Islands? Brethren, it works everywhere. It doesn't matter if you're in Jamaica, if you're in Guam, if you're in New Zealand, if you're in, a, in one of the states on the uh, uh, state side. What we're going to teach you this week works. We have seen remarkable results all over the world with what we're about to begin teaching this morning. So I'm excited to be here. Because I looked at Lima, I said, you know, Lima, when I go to the southeast of the United States and I say Church of Christ, most people know exactly who you're talking about. I love to go to a place when I say Church of Christ and they don't know the difference between you and a Mormon. They don't even know who you are. Because it is the fact that the most fertile fields in the world are the fields most neglected. And brethren, there are places in the world that have been so neglected and they need the gospel of Jesus Christ in such a way they don't know who you are. So you have an advantage, actually. They don't, you're starting at a clean slate. You don't have to de-teach. De you don't have to, to remove barriers, brethren. You just have to get to the heart of people and share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. And I believe with all my heart and soul, if the Honolulu people around this church building right now knew what was in your heart, if they knew you, they'd be here. I believe that. If they knew who you were right now, if they knew the joy and peace that you've got in your heart right now, if they knew what this church could offer them, this building would be full. Brethren, they're not here this morning because they don't know you. They're not here this morning because they don't know what you know. Our job as a church is to help this community know who you are. Because I truly believe if your friends and family, if they really, if they understood what you understand this morning, you couldn't contain them in this building. And that's our job. My first lesson is called Let's Get Motivated. As you can tell, I'm just slightly motivated this morning. I love the cross of Christ. There's nothing that motivates me more than Jesus Christ and his church. I want to share with you why I'm motivated. Let me share with you why I stepped out of full-time work after 23 years. Let me, let me tell you why we sold our house and we literally live out of a suitcase. And we go from city to city, town to town, state to state. And all we do is train soul winners. Let me tell you why. Because in the year 2000, there were 13,155 churches of Christ. Because in 2009, there were 12,629 churches of Christ. Because in 2015, there were 12,300 churches of Christ. Because in 2018, there were 11,965 churches of Christ. And in 2021, in the United States of America, there are 11,905 churches of Christ. Brethren, do you see a pattern? We're losing churches. We are watching the church of Christ disintegrate before our eyes, among the United States of America. I want you to go to year 2000 and look at church membership. 1,265,000 church members. 2009, 1,224,000 church members. 2015, 1,180,000 church members. 2018, 1,128,000 church members. 2021, 1,112,000 church members. And that does not take into consideration what COVID did to our ranks. Because 50% of our churches lost 25% of their members during COVID. The members just went away. And brethren, I'm sad to say that among most of our churches, that 25% probably is not coming back. The wheat and the chaff were separated. And as many efforts have been made to try to win them back to the cross, we have seen the, the numbers that are about to come out are going to be devastating. What we are seeing is the church of Christ we're watching the extinction of the Lord's church in our nation. And I'm going to give you some, some statistics that were put together by one of our Christian universities, and they will hollow you out. Because what we're seeing is that our churches right now are suffering 
And I saw those numbers. I sat in my office and I called some of my preacher friends. I said, have you seen these numbers? I said, not only are we not growing, brethren, we are losing church members at a remarkably fast pace. And that pace is just going to increase. And I'll, I'll prove that to you. I'll show you why. In this seminar, I'm going to lay out some numbers that are just going to take your breath away. Because what we're watching in the United States of America right now, which includes Honolulu, which includes Hawaii, is the Church of Christ is hemorrhaging church members. And brethren, if we don't address this, the Church of Christ isn't going to make it. What I'm talking about this morning is the most pressing need we have ever seen in this generation. If we do not address this problem, there will not be a Church of Christ for your children to attend. Brethren, we are a gray-headed church. I don't know if you've realized that or not, but most of our congregations are gray-headed. That means they're heavy on the older generation. They are light on the young generation. And we're seeing the Church of Christ thin out all over the country. And it doesn't matter if you live in Alabama, Tennessee, or Hawaii. It's all the same all over the country. So I looked at my family and I said, we can't, we, we've got we've to address this. And I noticed that uh, where I was preaching that we had bucked the trend. We started at 220 and we kept growing 250, 280, 300. And we did it because we evangelized. And it wasn't the first time I'd seen that. We had three full-time works and in every full-time work, we bucked the trend, meaning that we, 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 we turned it around and we saw churches grow from, from 50 to 60 to 80, from 110 to 150 to 160. And I said, I've got to train churches how to do this because you, you don't have to lose. Brethren, the church does not have to go the way of religion in America because you don't serve a God that knows how to lose. You serve a God that knows how to win. You serve a winning God this morning. You serve a God of victory. You serve a God that's given you everything you need to grow. And we've got to get members of the church of Christ to believe that. We've got to get members of the church of Christ to see their God the way I see our God. I see our God as a triumphant God, a God that doesn't know how to lose but I see loss all over the church members. When I look into the faces of elders and deacons and members of them, my preacher friends, what I see is loss. I see, I see hopelessness. They don't know how to do it. There was no church. There has never been a religion that was more effective in growing than the church of Christ. And brethren, we have lost the art. I'm sad to say that in many places we've lost it. We don't know how to do it anymore. So that's why we started this school. I want to give you an historical perspective of where we've come from. So let's look at this. 1906, there are 85 million people in the United States and 159,000 church members. Now, let me put that into a number you can kind of put your hands around. That means as you walk through the, uh, the, the mountains of Hawaii, if you go through the fields, if you go through the, the plains, you're going to find one Christian for every 535 people. It's not a good ratio, is it? 1946, <clears throat> 141 million people in our country, 682,000 church members. That's a ratio of 1 to 207. A lot better, isn't it? I mean, we got busy. The Church of Christ was growing. Look at 1953, 160 million people in the, in the U.S., 1.5 million members of the Lord's Church. That's one member of the Lord's Church for every 106 people. Got a lot better, didn't it? Watch this. 1967, 198 million people in this country, 2.35 million members of the Lord's Church. Now the ratio is 1 to 84. That ratio continued through the 1970s. Let me put that into perspective for you. That means that, brethren, for every 84 people you come across, there's a member of the Church of Christ. Can you imagine walking around Hawaii and every 84 people you meet is a member of the Church of Christ? Can you even imagine that? Brethren, no wonder God blessed America. America became the nation she is because righteousness exalts a nation and sin is a reproach to any people. This nation became great because the church became great. Don't ever forget that. I want you to notice what happened. Let's look at those numbers more carefully. The Church of Christ do, grew during World War I. The Church of Christ grew during the Great Depression. The Church of Christ grew during World War II. The Church of Christ grew during Korea. The Church of Christ grew during the Vietnam War. The Church of Christ grew during the feminist movement and during civil rights. During every major upheaval that this nation has experienced, the Church of Christ grew. Don't you tell me we can't grow. Your excuses do not work with this preacher. 
Because brethren, if we can grow during those times, we can grow today. Because there is nothing that Satan can put in our way that God cannot conquer. It's the brethren that don't believe. I'll tell you why we're not growing. I'll tell you why the numbers now look like this. One to 289. And that was pre-COVID. You don't want to know why we have done nothing but decline for 40 years. You want to know why that our numbers have become, our numbers have become so anemic. I'll tell you why. Let me be very, let me be very clear with you. You don't believe. And I'm not going to sugarcoat this at all. I'm going to be very honest with you. You do not believe. We don't believe. We don't believe this works. We believe this is a waste of time. Yes, we'll do it because our preacher wants us to do it. But I don't really think this is going to work. We've done this before. It, you can't, you, you know, if we can just hang on to what we've got, if we can keep the 100 here, that's success. Brother, if all you do is keep the 100, that's failure. Because your God doesn't like the status quo. He's a growing God. He's a God that says, go out here and reach lost people. We're not, we're not, we're not satisfied with status quo. And for most churches, if they just keep what they've got, they consider that success. Brethren, that tells a lot about us. That tells me that our frame of mind is really in the wrong place. We're not on the offense. Most churches play defense. That's what they do all year long. Go get on a sports team, just play defense. Think you ever win a game? Because you won't win a game if you don't learn how to score points. Now, you can play defense, and I'm not opposed to it, but you also serve an offensive God. He's an offensive God, brethren. Say that in your mind. He is an offensive God. I want to know, are you offensive? I didn't say offend. I say offensive. There's a difference. He's a God that takes the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he's a God that says, take it to your family. Take it to your friends. Take it to your loved ones. Help them see the love of the cross help them see the kind of people they can become because there's not a greater life to live than the life of a child of God. John 10, verse 10, Jesus said, I came to give life and that more abundantly. Do you believe that this morning? That God can give you the abundant life? I, I met Sister May this morning. She said she became a Christian two years ago, Lima. She said she studied with you. She says, I've got the abundant life. I got the life of a child of God. It turns the whole, it turns you, it turns the inside out. I bet this morning some of you understand that full well. We've got to share that with others. So why? Why aren't we sharing it? So what I'm going to do in this seminar, because the only way I know to communicate this first lesson is to do it personally. I'm going to tell you why I'm here. I sat in my office as the preacher for the Willett Church of Christ, and I got a phone call from a preacher by the name of Chris Coyle. Chris, uh, Chris is a... Uh, He's in Somerville, Tennessee, and I don't know Chris. I never met him, so I sat in my office. I answered the phone like I always do. Hey, this is Rob Whitaker, preacher, Willette Church of Christ. He said, uh, you, "You're the preacher, Willette." I said, "Yes, sir." He said, "My name's Chris Coyle. I preach Somerville." I said, "Nice to meet you, Chris." He said, preacher, I need your help. I said, well, tell me what you need. He said, I need you to go do a Bible study. Well, man, when he said that, I lit up. You know, I love Bible studies. I said, yes, sir. I said, yeah, I'd be love to do one. I said, who am I going to study with? He said, I, I need you to, I got this member. Her name is uh, Scarlett Mitchell, and she was a bird bull. She married William. William taught her the gospel. Now, she's got a mom and a dad back home, and she needs you to do a Bible study with them. I said, well, that's great. I said, oh, I can't wait. I said, uh, I said Look, who, who are they? He said, name's Jackie and Sheila Birdwell. I said, I don't know them, but I'll, I'll go meet them. So I'm writing down Jackie and Sheila Birdwell. I said, well, I said, Chris, this is wonderful news. I said, Chris, um, uh, what day are they expecting me? He said, well, we haven't selected a date yet. I said, no problem. I said, morning, noon, or night? I'll go whenever you want me to go. I said, Chris, two in the morning. I'll be there, you know? And he, I said, Chris, um, what day, when, when did they request the study? How long ago did they request this? He said, well... They haven't yet. I said, they haven't yet. I said, Chris, uh, wait, wait a minute. I said, what do, you, what do you want me to do? Just go to the door, knock, and say, my name's Rob Whitaker. I'm here to do a Bible study. It won't work very well. And he said, well, preacher, I'm not sure what you're going to do about this, but uh, that's your problem now. I said, well, thanks for nothing. I said, well, that, I, I got off the phone with him, and I said, that's a worthless phone call. I said, well, I mean, what am I supposed to do with that? So I, I just, you know, I had this piece of paper written down, Jackie and Sheila Birdmore, and I said, well, you know what? Um, that's, just, that's just ignorant. 
And I, I, I took the piece of paper, I crinkled it up, I put it in my waste paper basket, and I went down to the important things like completing church bulletins, things that really matter. And I got my church bulletin done, you know, and I made sure I folded it and I got it out there on the, you know, on the, on the, I got it out there on the table, just like a good preacher does. I put the, you know, put the rock on it so it doesn't blow away, you know, so the church members will be happy on Sunday morning. Brother, and I got out there to the truck and I started my truck to go home. And I said, Rob Whitaker, what in the world are you doing? I said, you, 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 you can't, you can't throw two souls away. So I walked back into my office and I got that piece of paper and I unfolded and I put it right there on my, on my desk. I don't know what I'm going to do with you, Jackie and Sheila, but I'm not going to throw you away. So I went home and I went through my Sunday routine, Bible class, Sunday morning worship, you know, we had nursing home ministry Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening. And I got in bed that night and I'm exhausted and I couldn't sleep. You know what I thought about Jackie and Sheila Birdwell. It's all I thought about. And um, I was like, man, I said, what am I going to I, I'm like, what am I going to do with this couple? I got to the office the next morning. I sat down in my chair. Do you know what was staring at me, Jackie and Sheila Birdwell? Brethren, I've been preaching the gospel for 15 years. I've gone to three schools. I grew up in the church, got a dad that's an elder. And I said, I don't know how to reach two sinners. You know, I think that's a sad commentary on preachers. I don't even know what to do with them. And I said, well... I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray about this. Anytime you get to a point in life and you don't know what to do, you need to pray. I, I bowed my head and I prayed. I said, God, help me. I don't know what to do. Help me reach Jackie and Sheila. Give me wisdom. I'll open a door of utterance. And so I finished a prayer. I said, well, God's not going to wave a magic wand, you know, and, 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 and just make them appear. I got to get ready for battle. Man, I got to get ready and I'm not ready. So I decided I was going to do something I'd never done before. I opened my Bible. And I'm going to study Jesus. He said, preacher, do you never study Jesus? Not like this. See, I studied Jesus as the, I studied Jesus as the, the one born of a virgin. I got that down. I got that down when I was in nursery, you know, school. I, I studied Jesus as my savior right on the cross. I, I got that down. The, I, I obeyed the gospel. I, I studied Jesus as the head of the church. I understand what that means. I studied Jesus as the coming Lord, the reigning, the reigning uh, king. I've got all that down. I didn't know what it meant for Jesus to be the greatest evangelist who ever lived. I didn't know what that meant. What made him good? Why was Jesus so good at converting people? Why was he so good at drawing crowds? Why, why were people attracted to him? What, what was it that made Jesus good at evangelism? I did not know. So I'm going to study that. Now I'm studying. Now I'm writing things down. Hey, every time Jesus meets a sinner, just about he does this. And every time somebody asks him a question, he does this. And I want, look at how many times Jesus says, I wrote these things down. I said, well, that's interesting. I never caught that before. Let me tell you what I concluded. The things that Jesus did that made him great, I did not do them. And the things that I did that I thought made me just this wonderful evangelist, guess who didn't do those things? Jesus. I said, man, I've got to do a complete overhaul of my evangelism techniques. I'm, going to, I'm not going to be the same guy. If I get a crack at Jackie and Sheila, I'm going to do it differently. Now, during that period of time, this young man comes home from the University of Tennessee, UT, and his name is Jonathan Smith. And Jonathan Smith has come on home, and uh, he's gotten his degree. He's going to be a school teacher. He's going to get married. This young lady he met at Carnes, and uh, I'm talking to him. He says, well, Rob, uh, he said, man, I got to go visit my best friend. I said, well, where are you going, Jonathan? He says, going to go visit Evan Birdwell. Are you related? Is he related to Jackie and Sheila Birdwell? Yeah. He said, that's like my second parents, Rob. That's my best friend. I said, wonderful. Take me with you. He said, take you with me. I said, yes, take, take me with you. Why would you want to go? Why would you want to go meet Evan Birdwell? I said, I got something I need to tell you, Jonathan. So I filled him in, you know, I'm in his car going down the road and we get to the house. I tell him, don't tell him I'm a preacher. I said, all you got to do is get me in the house. She, he, she opens, the, Sheila opens up, Jonathan, oh, this is wonderful, Jonathan, so good to see you, and you know, she hugs him, you know, oh, J Jackie, Jonathan's home from college, you know, and I mean, it's a family reunion going on, who do you got with you there, oh, that's my friend Rob, uh, well, any friend of Jonathan's, a friend of mine, come on in, now, like any good southern woman, she had sweet tea and chocolate chip cookies waiting for me, no papaya, 
but uh, it was good. I tell you, it was good. So I sat down in that, I sat down in that, uh, that uh, living room and we're just talking, right? And uh, oh, about 10 minutes. And then we had the awkward moment. Y'all know what that is, right? No one talks. We don't know what to say anymore. We, we've run out of hellos. Who'd you say you were again, sir? I said, yes, ma'am, uh, Sheila. My name is Rob Whitaker. And I'm the preacher for the Willett Church of Christ, and I think you have a lot of questions for me. She said, Jackie, the preacher for the Church of Christ is in this house. She says, I sure do. And she fired away. Brethren, it's like this woman had rehearsed those questions. I mean, they came one right after another, after another, after another. Now, I'm going to do something I've never done before, church. Now, listen to me. I'm not going to answer the questions. As tempted as I was, to answer all the questions, because that's evangelism. It's not. I decided not to answer. So what I did is I, I, I um, well, um, I deferred them. I just, you know, I moved them around. I kind of rolled them back around to the backside. I didn't do it. I wasn't ugly. Let me explain what I did. I, I wasn't ugly. I was very conversational. And I'm going to explain how this worked. So I just kind of deferred them around. And she'd ask me another one. I deferred it back. She'd ask me, I deferred it back around. So we did this for a while. She doesn't even realize I'm doing it, but I'm not answering. Finally, she gets it. She says, Jackie, why won't this preacher answer my questions? And I smiled because that's what I wanted. I said, Sheila, that's a great observation you just made. I said, uh, you know what? I'm not a very good teller, but I'm an excellent shower. I said, if you'd let me open my Bible, I think I could show you the answers that you want. <gasps> Jackie, thank you. Jackie, I think he wants to do a Bible study. Jackie, can we do a Bible study with a preacher for the church of Christ? He looks over and says, no, honey, I don't think it's ever wrong to study the Bible. And uh, she says, well, I thought, well, preacher, I, pre I'll tell you what, preacher. She says, I'll do this study with you if it's a secret study no one can know. Well, brethren, I've never done a secret study in my life. I don't even know what that means. And I said, well, I see you. I said, uh, well, I, I make a counter proposal. I said, um, I tell you what, I won't tell anybody but my elders. She said, well, why would you tell those men? I said, so they can pray about it. Well, she said, who are they? And I said, well, Alvin Allen, Hugh Wayne Clark, uh, Hugh Clark, Joe. Well, I know those men. She says, I, I know. She says, you can tell those men. She said, I grew up with them. Tell them not to tell anybody or they're excommunicate me. Now, brethren, I didn't even, I, the old Rob would have said, now, what does that mean? And, and have a study about it. The new Rob knows that that is a failure. I'm not touching it. I said, all right, Sheila. So I just left it alone. So I said, let's make the appointment. So I'm coming back the next day. I, I go over here to Nicole. I get back to the house. I tell Nicole, Jared, Hannah, I said, you'll never believe what just happened. It, it was like clockwork. It happened exactly like I wanted it to happen. We've been praying about this. I told my elders, and I'm going to do something as a preacher that's different. I'm going to get into the pulpit on that Sunday, and I'm going to begin training the church how to evangelize, because most churches have no idea how to do this, and I'm learning. So I explained to the church what just happened, but I, I couldn't tell them the name Jackie and Sheila Birdville. So we show up at the Bible study that, that Monday. Now, in your Evangelism Simplified book, you have three booklets. It's called Back to the Bible. Those are the three booklets I'm going to use. So, so I, we sat around the kitchen table. I said, let's bring out the, the green booklet here, Sheila. She said, okay. I said, Sheila, Jackie, got your Bibles? They said, sure do. I said, let's look at John chapter. Now, she said, now, Rob, you just wait one minute. I said, okay. She says, I need to tell you about my religious experience. I said, okay, Sheila, what happened? And Sheila said, now, Rob, she says, it was a dark and stormy night. Oh, no. I said, okay, Sheila. I said, tell me about this night. She said, Rob, I was driving along the, the road. And she said, Rob, she said, the lightning was striking. The rain was falling so hard. The wind was blowing. I couldn't see. Rob, she said, I knew at that point. She says, and all of a sudden, the lightning struck the tree. The tree caught on fire, came over the road. Rob, at that point, I knew I was going to die. I shut my eyes. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit came down, took over the car, moved me out of the way. You're laughing at me. You're, you don't believe me, do you? I knew you people in the church of Christ did not believe in the Holy Spirit. I, I, Sheila, I'm not laughing at you. Well, oh, 
Sheila, finish your story for me. I'm writing it all down. You know, I'm, write, I'm writing every word down. She said, Robin, all of a sudden, God moved the car out of the way, put me in a ditch. And right there, the shivers came over me. Robin, I knew I was being saved. And I said, Jesus, come into my heart and be my personal savior. And she said, Robin, it was wonderful. And then I went to church on Sunday and I testified about it. And they said, Sheila, it's time for a vote. And the whole church voted on my testimony. And they said, you have had a religious experience. You have been saved. Now, Rob, I think it was about three months later, we had a mass baptism and I participated. I said, Sheila, is that the only, is that all the story? She said, that's how it happened. I said, Sheila, would it be okay if we read John 8, 32? And she said, well, of course. I said, go ahead and read it. And ye shall know the truth. And the truth will make you free. I said, Sheila, I said, what makes you free? She said, the truth. I said, write that down in the blank. And she wrote it down. Brethren, and we started a Bible study. She's never done one in her life. Do you know most people who go to church? Let me tell you about your church friends have never done a Bible study. Brethren, they have never done this. They have never opened up their Bible and then a personal study with God. It's never happened. And she is, Jackie and Sheila begin to see things in that study they didn't know. By the end of the study, I could tell they're captivated. I could tell it's got them. It's, it's, it's pulling on them. Jackie says, Rob, there's some things I need to talk to you about. I said, Jackie, I'm listening. He said, Rob, um, well, I, I, I'm the deacon of the local missionary Baptist church. I said, well, Jackie, I said, I said, you must be a good servant. I said, they wouldn't ask you to be a deacon if you weren't a servant. She, she said, well, I tried. He said, Rob, I'm also the treasurer. You must be a good steward, Jackie. They wouldn't ask you to be a, now all my answers are very strategic and I'm, I'm trying to teach you something. All right, I'm teaching you something in this. So listen carefully. Jackie, you must be a good steward. They wouldn't ask you to be a treasurer if you weren't a good, a good steward, good accountable, you know. Well, I try. He said, uh, he said, Rob, I also teach the Bible class, you know, for the adults. Jackie, you must love the Bible. They wouldn't ask you to teach a Bible class if you didn't love the Bible. Well, I try, Rob, uh, I, I got to admit something. I learned things in this study I didn't know. I didn't know I wasn't under the Old Testament. And I've been teaching all these years, and I didn't know that. I said, well, Jackie, I appreciate your honesty. I've got an honest person sitting there. Do you know what the gospel of Christ does to honest people? It's amazing. Sheila looked up. She's not going to let her husband get one on her. Now, Rob, she says, now, Rob, nah, I got to tell you more about me. I said, what do you got? She, she said, well, Rob, I started the children's Bible classes in this church. And Rob, she says, when my children were small, we didn't have Bible classes. And I started them, Rob. She, I said, well, Sheila, Jesus loves little children. I said, I'm glad you love them too. I hope you're beginning to understand my answers. I'll explain it later. So we go through that. She said, Rob, would you come back? I said, sure. I said, I'll come back. And so we came back for study number two. Study number two is the blue booklet. You got it sitting there in your lap. It's the blue booklet. It's on the church of Christ. And I said, let's study about the Lord's church. Any, any, any Bible study that doesn't focus on the church that Jesus bought with his own blood, run away from it. Never be ashamed of the church of Christ. Never be ashamed of the church that Jesus bought with his own blood. And we studied about the church, and she, they loved it. Jackie looked at me, and this is what he said. He said, Rob, he said, I want you to know something. The things I've learned today, they're different than what I believe. But if it's in the Bible, I'll change. Isn't that wonderful? If it's in the Bible, I'll change. Is that your heart this morning? Does your heart say, if, if God says to do it in Scripture, I'll do it? Or as your heart say, I'll do what I want to do. I'll do what, you know, where, where's your heart this morning? Is it, I have a heart that says, whatever God says, I'll do it. And that's not always easy to do. That was Jackie and Sheila. It was incredible. I finished that study and I said, Jackie, I said, uh, would you like me to come back and do a third? He said, I would. So I did. Now, right before I get to that third study, I got to make a phone call. I'll just tell you, I'll be honest with you. I want to know a little bit more about their religion. I don't know what a missionary Baptist is. I have no idea. So I told Nicole, I said, Nicole, I'm going to call, uh, I'm going to call their daughter, Scarlett. So I got the phone call and I called her and she said, hello. I said, ma'am, my name's Rob Whitaker. Rob Whitaker, you're that preacher studying with my mama. Man, I couldn't talk for 30 minutes. That girl wouldn't let me talk. I mean, she's so excited. I couldn't get a word in. And uh, finally, I said, Scarlett, can I talk? She said, yes. 
I said, oh, I just have one question for you. I want to know why you became a Christian. Why, why aren't you a Baptist? Why, why, why'd you do that? She says, well, she said, Rob, um, she told me the whole story. It was incredible. I mean, this, this girl's honest. She just, I just read my Bible and I, I just wanted to be what the, I wanted to be who they were. I wanted to be just who they were in the Bible. I didn't, all I wanted to do is be a Christian. It's a, it's a, it was a invigorating story, but she told me two things that I'll never forget. And I want to share one with you right now. She said, Rob, the hardest day in my life was the day I told my parents I wanted to be a Christian. Uh, that's all I want to be. I'm just going to take a pause. Brendan, do you realize what you've got right now? You've got something so unique. If you're visiting this morning, let me, let me tell you something about, about the Bible and Christianity that's so, it's so powerful. We're not asking you to be anything other than what you read in this book. We're not asking you to be Episcopalian. We're not asking you to be a, 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 a Presbyterian. We're not asking you to be a, a, a Methodist. Listen to me very, we're not wanting you to be a Church of Christer. Do you know what we want? We want you to be a Christian, period. That's all we want. We're not a club. Brother, we want to be a member of the church you read about in this book. If that doesn't reach down into your soul and put a fire in you, brethren, you're in the coffin already. That's good stuff. The message we have right now is the greatest message the world has ever heard. It is the healing balm of Gilead, and it's what this nation needs. I love it. You don't have to make this stuff up. You don't have to come up with some kind of sales pitch to get him in here. Brethren, you've got the cross of Jesus Christ sitting right in front of you. Try to tell God no and see how you sleep at night. You ever have a hard time sleeping? Because you know what this book says and you've not done it? Because that's what God does. Well, I got to, she, Scarlett says something to me. She said, hey, Rob, she says, um, she says uh, the, night, the day I told my parents, I said, I got to tell you something. I've been studying mom and dad with my, with my boyfriend, William. We've been studying the Bible together. Mom and dad, I, I realize I just want to be a Christian. Uh, what do you mean, Scarlett? You're already a Christian. Mom, I, I'm not. I've not done what this book says. And she explained it to him. They were just, you know, they were just, they couldn't believe it. And they said, Scarlett, you know, if that's the decision you've made, we can't change you. But Scarlett, you got to realize something. If you decide to do this, we've got to excommunicate you. I said, what does that mean, Scarlett? She says, well, Rob, that means the deacons are coming. I said, the deacons? I said, what are they coming to do? She said, well, Rob, they're bringing the briefcase. The, the briefcase? I said, well, what's in the Scarlett? And the Scarlett said, Rob, I was ready. She said, I had my Bible, and I was going to show them, Rob, why I did what I did. I wanted my parents to hear why I became a Christian. Now, watch this. She said, they entered my house, brought the briefcase, and they sat down. They opened the briefcase, and inside the briefcase was the church roster, and they read it. And when they got the, they got the uh, Scarlet Birdwell, they said, uh, Scarlet Birdwell, and they brought out the big eraser, the big one, and they erased me. Scarlet, uh, what else did they do? Oh, they put it back in the briefcase. And, and Scarlet, what else did they do? Oh, they left. Scarlet, I'm confused. I, I, I don't understand. Is there anything else that went on? Did they try to win you back? Did they try to ask you why you did what you did? Did they even have a Bible in their hand? She said, Rob, they didn't even bring a Bible. She said, I had my Bible open and I was ready. I wanted them to explain why we don't do what this book says. And they did not even ask me. Let me tell you what my mother's reaction was. My mother was livid. I mean, Jackie, we've gone to this church all our lives, and we didn't even try to win our daughter back. Not one Bible was brought. Not one Bible verse was quoted. Brethren, we are people of the book. Don't ever forget that. Everything we do revolves around what God says, not what I want. This is not a church that follows what I feel or I want. This is a church that follows what does God say, and we don't cherry pick it. In Psalm 119, the Bible says, a sum of thy word is true. We believe as strongly in John 3, 16 as we do Mark 16, 16. Amen, church. When I got through with that phone call, I, I was stunned. And he, she told me something else I'm going to share with you later. Now, I, I, I show up at the house that, that day for the Bible, the third study, the red booklet. I, I'm a, 
Before I walk into the house, Jackie, man, he wasn't born yesterday. This man, is, he, he knows. He said, Sheila, you and I need to have a talk. So husband and wife are going to have this talk. He said, that preacher from Willette's coming over here today. He thinks he's going to baptize us. He's got another thing coming. He said, I've been a Baptist all these years, and I'm going to die a Baptist. And Sheila says, shoot. She said, Jackie, I was born a Baptist. Mama's a Baptist. Grandmama's a Baptist. Great grand. Aunt so-and-so plays the piano. She says, and I'm going to die one. And Jackie says, I'm glad we've got that covered. Never underestimate the power of the word of God, because this book has the power to make people and mold people into the image of Christ. And I don't care where you've come from. I don't care what 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 cultural heritage you've got. I don't care where you live in the world. Dear friends, the cross of Jesus Christ is for all people and at all times. And this book has the power to change hearts. And I believe that with all my heart this morning or I would not be here. I sat down and we went through that scriptures and he's reading them, right? He loves it. I can see it's in his heart. You know what else I see? I'm a student of human behavior. I see tears form in the corner of his eyes. You know what that tells me? He gets it. You remember that day when you realized I'm lost. I thought I was saved, but I'm lost. I mean, I thought, and I could see it. He's shaking. Sheila just won't even look at Jackie won't look at me. So I, I called for the invitation, Lima. I forget, forget going to the end. I just said right there, I said, Jackie and Sheila, I need to know what you're going to do with this stuff. And Jackie looked up at me and he looked over at his wife. He says, oh, Rob. He says, I know exactly what I need to do and we're going to do it. Man, chills. It, it, my chills just ran up and down my arms just like right now. I, I I remember that day like I'll never forget it. And 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 I said, Jackie, that's great. I said, I said, let's go do it right now. Sheila looked over at her husband, says, Jackie, and she hit him in the gut. I mean, she hit his her husband and he grabbed him. He said, What was he said, you said we weren't going to do that. And uh, he says, Sheila, we have no choice. It's what the Bible says. How many of you have been there? It's what the Bible says. You can try to argue with God you won't win. He will wear you down. You think you can argue with God? It won't work. I looked at Jackie. I said, let's go to the church building right now. I said, let's go. He said, Rob, I can't tonight. I said, Jackie, what in the world are you waiting for? You're lost. So I went into closing mode. Here's what I did. I went to, I went to Agrippa. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Don't be like Agrippa. I went, I went to Felix. He, he was, he, when he learned the truth, he trembled, but he didn't obey. Don't be like Felix. And I went over here to, I went over here to James four life is but a vapor. You might not be here tomorrow. And I went to Silas, the same hour of the night. I went off. Do you know what happened that night? He wouldn't budge. And man, I, I didn't understand. I said, Jackie, what are you waiting for? You're lost. He said, Rob, you don't get it. He said, I hold the bag. I said, the bag. He said, Rob, I have have all the money. It's in this house. Rob, I'm the treasurer. i got to give it up. I've got to resign. Brethren, I struggled with that for years as I taught this seminar. I didn't understand how to explain it. I I understand. You know, it doesn't take long for a 15-year-old boy to repent. It takes a whole lot longer for a 55-year-old man to repent. He had to make changes in his life. Jesus said, bring ye therefore what? Fruits worthy of? repentance. He's got to repent. He said, I got to give it up. He said, Rob, you mark this down. I will obey. And your family can come by and see us every day until we do. Don't worry, we did. We came back to their house every day. Now, I don't know what a garden looks like in Hawaii, but in, 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 in Tennessee, that means you got tomato plants. That means you got onions. That means you got bell peppers coming out of your ears. They just never stop growing. And you just, you just, you know, and I went over every day and collected them. I had more tomatoes than I knew what to do with. But he was going to see my face every single day. It was Wednesday night, and there's usually around 200 of us on a Wednesday night. And I was standing in the back of the auditorium, and I was talking to one of our deacon's wives. Her name's Sister Jill. And uh, Rob. Yes, Jill? Rob, look over there. I said, yeah. I said, that's Jackie and Sheila. Rob, that is Jackie and Sheila Birdwell in this church building. I said, I know. Rob, I know them. Rob, do you know where they're from? I said, I do. No, Rob. She said, Rob, is that them? 
Rob, is that the family you've been studying with? I said, it is. Oh, Rob, I can't believe it. So you don't believe, do you? You do not believe this works. You don't believe you can reach people like Jackie and Sheila. You can't reach your parents. You can't reach your friends. You can't reach your family. You can't reach your coworkers. You can't reach your ball team members. It doesn't work. We're too far gone. Is that where you are this morning? Because that's where most members of the church are. That's why we're not growing. I want you to know what happened that Wednesday night when Jackie and Sheila got up during the invitation song and they walked forward. There was not a dry eye in that church. That day, the church wept because the Church of Christ at Willett saw something they had never seen like that before, and they believed. It's powerful when the church believes. Do you believe? Because my goal this week is to get you to believe this works. Because if you don't believe this works, if I go through all this and you don't believe this works, you know what's going to happen to this church? You're going to go back to what you've been doing. And if you want to rely on your preacher to do all your evangelism, you will fail. I need you to get busy, brother. The Lord needs you, sister. We're not done. This is Jackie Birdwell just a few months after that uh, conversion. Do you know what he's doing right here? That's, a, that's an invitation in the Lord's church. How quickly can your life change like that? Just like that. This is our son, Evan. We're not done. And I have now, my family now has made a commitment to God. We're going to evangelize. It's going to be the most important mission in my life. And we did. Hey, Jackie, let's do a Bible study with Evan. He said, now, Rob, it won't work with Evan. Jackie, of course it will. Rob, now Evan's a little different. Jackie, we're all different. Rob, Evan, a little back. Jackie, we're all backwards. Sheila heard the conversation. She says, now, Rob, she said, Jackie, you know our son needs a Bible study. Get over there and do a Bible study with Evan. Well, I chose to listen to Sheila. So I went over to do the, you know, I, so I walked over to, to Evan. I said, hey, Evan, I said, you, you've been a lot of changes in your family, your sister, your dad, your mom. You know, he said, I don't want to talk about it. Well, he closed that door, didn't he? So I said, well, man, that didn't work very well. And um, so I, I never give up on people. I never give up. If, I, if you're on my target list, I am relentless. And I came back. I'm going to do it again. I said, we're sitting there talking. You do some new convert studies with Jackie and Sheila. Evan would always listen, you know. And he was very, he's very, uh, he, he loves to talk. And what he really likes are my airplane stories. I'm a pilot. And, um, and I, so I said, I got it. I said, hey, Evan, would you like to go up in the airplane with me? He said, yeah. He said, man, I'd love to do that. I, I said, I said, okay, meet me at the airport tomorrow, Lafayette. I'll take you up there where you want to go. He said, you take me around Sal Salina Lake? I said, yes, sir, I will. I said, when they dammed it up over there, I said, it's a pretty, it's beautiful. You can see an old city. They flooded it when they dammed it. It's beautiful. He said, man, I want to go. And so we got out in the airplane, you know, we pre-flighted, we took off, you know, got up to about 5,000 feet. Brethren, you can baptize anybody at 5,000 feet. Let me tell you what, they're very receptive during those times. You just roll it over and they'll do anything. No, I would not do that, brethren. That's not me. And um, we flew around and I landed the plane. I said, Evan, today is your day. I said, I'll tell you what. I said, um, I said, uh, would you like me to take you out to eat? He said, yes, it's only a Subway two for five preacher special. I said, yes, let's go to Subway two for five. Y'all have two for five in Honolulu and uh, Subway. So we went to Subway. We had our two for five. I got him just where I want him. I said, Evan, could I tell you a little bit more about Jesus? He says, I don't want to talk about Jesus. At that point, I just about threw my hands up and I said, yeah, I mean, what do, you, what do you expect me to do? And, um, but he said this, Rob, he said, when I'm ready, I'll let you know. I'll take that. I went home, told my wife, I said, we made progress. Evan says, when he's ready, I'll be the first to know. So um, months passed by, didn't hear from him. I'd see him, didn't hear from him. I went to Bible camp. Something happened during Bible camp that doesn't normally happen. Let me show you what it was. Hello, my phone rang. My phone doesn't normally ring at Bible camp. The signal is almost non-existent. Hello? Um, Rob, this is Amy. I don't know who Amy is. Rob, I think I'm going to hell. Can you do a Bible study with me? 
Now, brethren, I've never had a phone call like that in my life. I, I, did. I said, yes, yes, Bible, yes, Amy, Bible. who in the world is Amy? I said, Amy, why do you think you're going to hell? She says, well, my friend gave me this book called Muscle and, well, Scarlet Birdwell gave me, oh, that's Evan's sister, this book called Muscle and a Shovel. <laughs> and, and I read it, and I think I'm going to, Rob, would you do a Bible study? I said, yes. I said, this is Amy's, this is, this is Evan's girlfriend, Amy. That's Amy. I said, I know who this is. I said, yes. As soon as I get back, we'll do the Bible study. She says, wonderful. She said, Rob, I've got one condition. I said, name it. She says, uh, you got to do the study with Evan too. I said, Amy, uh, do you not know that Evan doesn't want to do a Bible study? She says, I know, but that's your problem now. <sighs> this is unreal. And I said, okay, um, I got it. I said, do you know how Sheila, Evan's mama, likes to do Sunday dinner? Any of you ladies like to do Sunday dinners and invite people over? It was very, that, that was common in our, in our in, in, for many years, generations. It's not common today, but she still does it. And so I said, I want you to make sure that Sheila fixes Evan's favorite dish and make sure that Evan knows we're coming to eat and that we're going to do a Bible study with you. Evan will stay. Problem solved. That's great. And so, so we show up at the house, we eat dinner, we get the Bible. Scarlett, his sister, she's traveled all the way from Memphis just to watch this. She's at the house too, you know. We're all got, I said, Amy, let's go ahead and start the Bible study. And Evan looked up and says, not me, nuh-uh. He walked out of the house, got in his Mustang, and drove away. Amy's devastated. She's in tears. She's crying. Nicole's comforting her. Nicole says, Amy, it's okay. She says, I don't understand why my boyfriend does not love the Lord. And then um, there was Scarlett, the sister, typical sister. What is wrong with my stupid brother? He is what? He is so dumb, you know, and that, that's the sister, right? Then there's, there's mama in the uh, kitchen. And mama says, well, I don't know how embarrassing, you know, the preacher comes and he just walks out. She says, I'm so dumb. I'm embarrassed. And then there's daddy. Now, I don't know about you dads out here, but this was, this was, uh, this was um, Jackie. He's in the easy chair reading the newspaper. He looks up and says, I told y'all this wouldn't work. He went back to the paper. Family's falling apart. And I said, uh, hey, guys, I said, we need to do this Bible study, Amy. She says, I know, Mr. Rob. We passed out the booklets, the Bibles, and we started. John 8, 32, ye shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. I said, Amy, what makes you free? She says, truth. I said, put it in the blank. Let's go to the next one. John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. What's the truth, Amy? She says, the word of God. I said, put it in the blank. And all of a sudden, Evan drives back up, gets out of his car, comes into the house and sits down. Scarlett's so excited, she hands him back to the Bible. She says, I don't want that. I just want to listen. Amy says, now, honey, you'll need the Bible. He says, I don't want the Bible. I just want to listen. And he did. By the end of the study, he's answering the questions. I know what the problem is. He won't do this by himself. He's not going to do it by himself. Not when we're there. He wants to be alone. He does not want an audience. So my, my wife and I invited Evan to the house and Amy, we did the next study in our home and he was spot on. He took the Bible, he took the booklets, he opened the scripture and he knows it. Something happened with Evan and Amy that I got to tell you about. If you want to learn it, you're going to have to come back this week because I'm going to finish that story, but it will help you learn how to reach people. Brother, from that day forward, I want you to know what my family did. We just started evangelizing. We were told men like Ed Goolsby would never obey the gospel. He was our next door neighbor. Leave him alone. Guess what he did? Obeyed the gospel. Our church, when I got there, was 220. We're an hour from a grocery store. This, this environment for me, this environment where you have people all around you, stores everywhere, is foreign to me. I live in the middle of nowhere. You have to drive an hour to get to a grocery store where I live. So if the church of Christ is going to grow where I live, guess what we have to do? We have to evangelize. No one's moving in because of a military base. You're not going to get good young men like Jedediah moving in. They're not, they're not, there's no reason for them to come. The only way the church grows is because you evangelize. You've got to go door to door, neighbor to neighbor, and you've got to do Bible studies. He's a city manager of Carthage. 
That's his wife. His son's not pictured, baptized them. I wish I had time to tell you about them. It was an amazing conversion. We started at 220. We went to 230, 250, 270, 290, 300, and we just kept growing. It's Ronnie Rhodes. He literally sat in our pews for 30 years. No one did a Bible study with him. I was told not to. I was actually told, if you do that, you run him off. And I looked at one of the men who told me that, and I said, if he leaves, he'll be no worse off. You can't get more lost than lost. Sitting in the pews does not make you saved, by the way. You have to obey the gospel. As Jerry Conley, when I got to Jacksonville, Alabama, Alan Webster, I said, tell me, who sits in your pews that's lost? And he gave me the name Jerry Conley. I went to visit him. My wife and I did the studies. It's amazing what happens when you evangelize. I just got to teach you how to do it. That's why you're here this week. It's not as simple as just sitting down with somebody and say, let's study the Bible. That won't work. You just don't hand them back to the Bible. That's a failure. I've got to teach you this week how to do this stuff. I'm going to close my lesson this morning with one story. When I was young, my father, uh, he worked for Delta Airlines. My dad's with us uh, somewhere. His name, he's in the back. His name's Gary. My dad worked for Delta Airlines, and uh, my dad moved us out to Bulverde, Texas. It's a country town. My dad wanted to raise us in the country. So he bought some acreage. We had chickens, goats, uh, fences, and it was just, it was, it was a great time. I got bored. And so I looked at my mom and said, Mom, I'm bored. I was just a little guy, you know, you know, just in elementary school. And she said, well, go make a friend. I said, okay. So I, I walked a half a mile down the road. That's how you used to do it. And uh, I knocked on the door. And that's called a Facebook friend request. Watch this. And I said, he, he opens the door. And he said, uh, I said, my name's Rob. He said, my name's Mel. I said, would you be my friend? He said, sure. That's how we used to do it. All right. No Facebook. All right. So, so we became friends. We well, I had horses. We rode horses all over the countryside. I noticed something different about Mel. Um, Mel has uh, statues of Mary all over his house. He's got crucifixes everywhere. And I don't understand why. So I said, Dad, why does Mel have all that? He said, son, Mel's Catholic. I don't know what that is. I just know Christian because that's all I read about in the Bible. And I said, well, what, is, what, is, what do you mean by Catholic? He explained it. I said, well, Dad, I want him to be a Christian. He said, son, you need to teach him. Now, brethren, I didn't know a whole lot about how to do this. So let me tell you what I did. For the next 10 years, Mel and I would have these conversations. And I'd say, hey, Mel, uh, why do you call your Catholic priest father? And the Bible says, call no man your father, but your father in heaven. He says, I don't know, Rob. Mel would go back to his house and study on it. He never found an answer. I said, hey, Mel, why do you, why do you guys uh, sprinkle babies? When in the Bible, you're immersed. Why? He said, I don't know, Rob. He said, so he went home and tried to study it. Couldn't find it. I said, hey, Mel, uh, where's Catholic Church in the Bible? He said, what's well, there somewhere? So he went home and looked. Couldn't find it. One day, Mel came up to me, and we were about 17 years old. He said, Rob, I want to become a Christian. Man, that's the greatest day in my life. I, 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 I was just wonderful. I said, this is great, Mel. I said, I'm so thankful for your heart. He said, Rob, I want to become a Christian. So I went to tell my parents about it, and, uh, and, and they're congratulating Mel, you know, telling how proud they are of him. But no, Mel's a devout Catholic. He goes to catechism classes. He's an altar boy. They go every Saturday. So this isn't going to be easy. And um, Mel says, Rob, I need your help. I said, what do you need? He said, I need you to explain this to my dad. I said, hey, this is great. I said, we're going to convert his whole family. This is wonderful. And I said, mom, dad, I'll be back. Going to convert Mel's parents. This won't take long. We, 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 we went down to this house about a half mile down the road. No, came in, Mr. Hutzler, um, I'd like to talk to you. Sir, sit down about the Bible. So he grabs his Bible. I grabbed my Bible. We're on two sides of the table, and I started the study. Didn't go very well. His dad, the more I talked, the angrier the man got. And uh, he, he started yelling. Then he started cursing. And then he started throwing things at me. And um, Mel's dad is a violent man. I don't normally talk to him. And, um, and, and uh, Mel's trying to help his dad understand what the Bible says. His dad wants nothing to do with the Bible. And his dad says, you know, he's, he's cursing at me. And uh, he finally, Mel gets up and says, Rob, you got to get out of this house before my dad hurts you. So literally, Mel carried me out of the house. 
and I went home. And I crawled into the arms of my mother and I cried because I think I just lost my best friend. The greatest day in my life turned to the worst day of my life in a matter of one hour. Have you ever seen that happen before? And um, I didn't know what to do. And suddenly, nine o'clock that night, around nine o'clock, the doorbell rang. And my dad said, son, come with me. That's kind of odd. We live way out in the middle of nowhere. The doorbell don't normally ring at nine o'clock. My dad opens the door. On the other side of the door is Mel Hutzler with two suitcases in his hand. He said, Mr. Whitaker, I want to become a Christian. My dad says, if I choose to become a Christian, I have no place to live. Mr. Whitaker, will you help me? And my mother grabbed him and she held him and hugged him and said, son, as long as we're in this house, this house belongs to you. You can live here. And Mel Hutzler moved into our house. Weeks went by. He still hadn't obeyed the gospel. He still hadn't become a Christian. And it was struggle. And uh, his dad is so violent. And my dad met with Mel and said, Mel, we've got to make peace with your family. And he said, what can we do? So Mel sits down with his dad and they have this long discussion. Here's the conclusion. Son, if you want to become a Christian, you can become one, but you got to do a Bible study with a monsignor first. And whatever decision you make, I'll respect it. And Mel said, man, that, I said, Mel, this is wonderful. I said, we're going to do a Bible study with a monsignor. We're going to convert the whole Catholic church. This is great. And, uh, and so, you know, we're excited. We're studying our Bibles. We're, we're underlining passages. The day of the study, Mel gets, I get sick. I get the stomach flu. I said, Mel, postpone the study. He said, Rob, I, I can't. My dad said, you're not allowed to come. I said, Mel, you, you can't do a study with a monsignor by yourself. He said, I won't be. And he held up his Bible. And he traveled over to that Catholic church and he opened his Bible. And he did a Bible study. The Catholic priest looked at him. He said, son, stop quoting me that book. And Mel quoted it again. He said, would you explain to me why in Acts 8, the Ethiopian eunuch went down into the water and why we sprinkle? And he couldn't. He said, give me that book. He said, no, I want to know why here in this book, the Bible says you're to go down into the water and you, we sprinkle babies. He said, son, I told you, give me that book. He literally took the Bible out of Mel's hands, put it on the desk. He said, my job is to tell you what that book says. And we don't just go by the Bible. We go by the Bible and tradition, and it, I'll interpret it for you. Mel grabbed his Bible and said, as far as I'm concerned, this Bible study is over. And on Sunday morning at the Northern Oaks Church of Christ in San Antonio, Texas, an 18-year-old young man walked forward, and he was baptized by Daryl Conley, our preacher. That picture is taken at the Southwest School of Bible Studies. We went to preaching school together. That picture is taken at the Northern Oaks Church of Christ recently where Mel Hutzler serves as their preacher. He is also now one of their elders. So all of you in the audience this morning that said this won't work, I want you to feast your eyes on that. Because what we're going to do this week will be transformation. You can't miss a lesson. Whatever you got scheduled, cancel it. Call in sick. I'm just, I'm just kidding. I don't want you to be dishonest. Get sick. <laughs> Lima will help you, right, Lima? All right. Brethren, you need to be here. Because what we're going to talk about this week is the most important thing on earth. I want to help you reach your parents that are lost, or your sister, your brother, or your neighbor. And I can't do it if you're not here. So either you believe the Lord or you don't. I do. I do. Do you? Look at it. They're everywhere. And if you don't do your job, they're going to be lost. God bless you. Thank you for allowing me to be here. We'll take a short break.